Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, um, um, I'm very happy to speak here, and I'm also very happy to, to tell you all that uh, I'll be around uh, beginning in April, um, joining the um, electri electrical engineering faculty at NUS. Um, <clears throat> yes, so the topic is uh, quantum advantages in, in computing. Um, and uh, I mean, why, um, I first want to motivate a little bit, why, why do we care about this? And uh, so I really like this, <coughs> this nice image here. Uh, I didn't like the article that was uh, it used in. So, so this, this article um, in one of the major uh, glossy journals in engineering um, was making a case against uh, quantum computing. So there are still people who believe that there is some kind of physics that we don't yet understand, which would uh, come in when we try to scale uh, quantum devices to a level where we could do useful computations with them. Um, um, even though there, there's no indications that such a thing might happen, it still kind of poses a question to theorists about thinking about how can we actually prove that a device uh, performs a quantum computation and uh, that cannot be easily simulated. So this kind of uh, led to a whole area of research. Um, I'm going to talk about two aspects of that. So first I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview and then also talk about the a particular results we, we had in this area. Um, so <clears throat> the basic issue um, is that it's, it's actually quite difficult to show uh, an advantage in, uh, for quantum computers. But when we think a little bit more about um, quantum theory in general, and in particular communication, then we see that in, in, in a setup where we have some communication constraints, um, we, we have been able to show quantum advantages for a long time already. So every, every Bell violation is a, a quantum advantage, and, and it's even robust under noise. And that's, that has all been verified for a very long time. So it seems that these um, constraints in communication um, actually are helpful in, in exhibiting uh, quantum advantages. So this is going to be a little bit of a theme. So um, first, um, let me like uh, do a little excursion into the complexity zoo. So this is this is very. Um, this is essentially just to argue why it's difficult to show that, that quantum computers really can do something that classical computers cannot. And uh, the reason is, is we have this kind of landscape of, of complexity uh, series. So the P problems are those that, that we believe um, uh, classical computers can efficiently solve. And PQP would be the same for, for quantum computers. Now, um, these inclusions, we know that P is in, in BQP, obviously. A uh, quantum computer can also do classical computations. And then they're, they're contained in this larger class P space, which is just uh, problems that can be solved in, in polynomial space. Um, so the issue is that in classical, purely classical complexity theory, um, there has been this question for a long time, and it's still open. And that question is whether these two uh, classes are actually the same. So you might know that the famous question P equal NP. This is a slightly uh, easier question in a way, um, but it's also unsolved, and it has been unsolved for, for a very long time. Now, if we could show that there exists a problem that can be solved by a, a quantum computer but cannot be solved by a classical computer, then that would show this separation. So that would solve this, this long-standing open problem. So, so this is kind of um, tells us why, uh, why this is a difficult uh, question from, from the, the theory side. OK, so I just wanted to, um, oh, it's a lot of them. Yeah. Um, I, just because of some recent, uh, very recent uh, activity, actually, some very recent result, I want to um, um, continue this excursion into complexity for a little bit more. So. Um, and, and it's also kind of to show again that, that communication constraints might be, might be very helpful. So there's this, these complexity classes where essentially um, the task is now for, for a prover to convince uh, a verifier using 
communication between them that, that a certain problem is either has a positive or a negative solution. Um, and these classes are, are quite well understood. So, for example, one can show that uh, in, in this context, it doesn't really matter whether we have uh, a classical um, or a quantum um, uh, computers. So they, they have the same power. Um, but if we introduce uh, um, uh, some constraint on, on these provers, so now we have two provers, and the, the verifier can kind of talk to both of them and challenge them independently, and they cannot uh, communicate with each other. So this is kind of a, a, a setting that's, that's uh, different and more powerful. Um, and in this case, we know that uh, if we replace these classical computers with quantum computers, suddenly um, this, this uh, complexity class becomes extremely powerful. And this was actually just shown on Monday, so I hope, I hope it will stand. Um, but um, <clears throat> so what this, what this shows is that, OK, so it, it doesn't really matter what exactly these complexity classes are, but the one thing is this, um, this class here corresponds to the, the, the communication uh, to two quantum provers um, communicating with, with the classical verifier. Um, and this class is, is, is essentially, uh, it contains all computable problems. Um, and even more, so it, even the halting problem is, is contained in this class. So it's incredibly uh, powerful what you can do in, in this setting. Whereas here, I mean, these are also large classes, but um, you can clearly see um, a gap. And this, this now c could be proven um, even on this, this very general complexity theoretic level, where for a single device, we, we, don't, we cannot show any such separation. There are many acronyms. <laughs> um, so, I mean, this this is an interactive proof. That's just uh, what it's called when you when you have this uh, discussion that is aims to convince the verifier of. Um, and QIP is just with uh, with quantum computers the same thing. Then here we have multiple interactive prover. That's the M. Um, M I P star means that you have quantum. And they have entanglement between the two um, um, uh, provers. QMIP would be um, is a different class where, where everything is quantum, um, but it turns out to be they have the same power. Um, these are the recur um, recursive enumerable um, problems. So that's uh, the halting problem is is the famous one in there. Uh, and this next is uh, is is um, for exponential time. Um, so it's like NP is for P, it's the, the um, next is for exp. Yeah. OK, so, um, so yes, um, so that was kind of um, motivation and, and uh, recent results. So, so the topic of the talk is kind of how do we uh, come from from quantum advantage to to show uh, quantum computational supremacy. Um, so that's going to be the first part, and then I'm going to give a, an example of of a, a problem where we uh, can show a, a quantum computational advantage, but that might not be so useful for for quantum computational supremacy. But uh, I'll get to that. Um, so first, uh, it's it's an issue of of definitions, and 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 in fact. Um, there seems to be a lot of confusion about um, what these terms, all of these terms really mean. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm going to try to make them a little bit more clear. So, so this is actually the, the Prescott's definition of, of quantum uh, computation supremacy. Uh, the day when well-controlled quantum systems can perform tasks surpassing what can be done in the classical world. Now, that kind of definition seems a bit incomplete, and, and people have it in many ways because um, you could say that maybe um, I mean in in iron traps for example you can you can do some some kind of simulations that maybe would be very difficult to classically um, uh, simulate already but the, the 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 point here is that it has to be well controlled in in a certain sense and and we'll get um, we'll get to make this a little bit more precise <coughs> 
Okay, so so in order to understand this, um, first I would define what is a, a quantum computational advantage. So as I mentioned, a quantum advantage um, could be anything. Uh, sorry, about this. Um, a quantum advantage could be, for, for example, you can see in a non-local game or in the violation of a Bell inequality, but when it comes to computing, we kind of have to, to define it um, as, a, as a property of a, of a class of computational problems um, or a sequence of computational problems uh, where we increase the size of, of different problem instances and um, we ho have an asymptotic gap between the runtime we expect for, for classical and quantum devices uh, under, certain, um, uh, under certain reasonable assumptions. Now, what that reasonable assumption means, um, that's usually, uh, as we've seen, we, we, we need to, to kind of enforce a separation <laughs> between BQP and, and P so that these complexity clauses are different. So we need to, to input some kind of additional complexity theoretic assumption so that, that this, um, this gap um, opens up. And so then we have to trust this, this assumption. So that's the minimum thing we kind of uh, need here. Um, now, there are kind of um, problems that have um, such advantages um, um, under, under such assumptions. So for example, the, um, what is this? Shor's algorithm. I don't know what I was thinking here. Shor's algorithm for factoring. Um, so that one, um, th 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 there's always a joke that there are only two uh, algorithms in, in quantum information, but then one probably shouldn't mess them up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, okay, so that there's, um, this one here, the assumption is essentially, is, is very direct. The assumption is that the factoring problem itself is, is difficult for classical computers, which um, we all uh, believe, I, I think, because People have tried to find efficient algorithms for it and haven't and have failed so far, but it's an assumption. We don't, we can't actually prove that. Um, and there are other um, problems with, with the different kind of assumptions that go into it. Uh, most of the problems that that are interesting for this quantum computational supremacy experiments are, are actually uh, not so useful. So they're, they're kind of random problems that uh, where the structure is kind of introduced. Uh, or the randomness is introduced to, to make, make them easier to analyze. Um, okay, so, so that's uh, quantum advantage. And then um, for quantum computation supremacy, uh, we need multiple ingredients. So first of all, we need some kind of uh, class of, of problems that have a quantum advantage. Um, but then we also need to make sure that this, this robustness uh, sorry, that this, this class of problems is, is somewhat robust under noise because in, in every attempt to, to experimentally verify um, 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 the advantage, we will encounter noise and then we need to make sure that uh, in the noisy case, the, the simulation, the classical simulation is still difficult. So this is actually a, a very uh, important part of, um, of this discussion. And then um, we need a, a, a large enough programmable uh, quantum that can solve instances of the problem uh, for which we, we, we think we cannot simulate them classically yet. So, okay, so this is a bit, um, it's a bit rough, um, especially because you never know whether there might be um, um, more powerful classical computers coming up, but kind of the, the idea is that since since we we uh, we have um, um, a, a problem that where asymptotically this gap increases and and this gap is supposed to be robust on the noise, so even if at, at in, in a couple of years we could solve this this problem with the classical computer, but then we'll have a few qubits more and 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 this this kind of uh, gap will will ensure that that um, um, quantum computers will forever be more powerful uh, to, solve for, to solve these problems. So it's kind of, it, it's, it's formulated as a milestone that um, after which you've reached it, it should not be possible anymore to, for classical computers to ever catch up. That's kind of the idea. So you need, to, it's important to have these 
these asymptotic con considerations as part of it. And uh, I mean, these definitions, it's actually quite hard to, to find uh, precise definitions for this uh, online. They're more or less in line with um, what Google in their, in their seminal paper uh, put down as, as their definition of, of quantum computational supremacy, except that they didn't really talk about noise too much. Um, okay, so um, now we can kind of um, look at now different approaches that have been um, used to, to um, show such a, a quantum advantage, or different kinds of problems. Um, so the first part is, is the one that, that I've mostly been talking about and, and that kind of led to this, this Google experiment. Um, here the idea is really that we, we need to introduce these additional complex theoretic assumptions um, and using them um, we can find certain problems um, that cannot be solved efficiently with the, with the classical computer but can be solved efficiently with the quantum computer. These problems are usually sampling problems. So, so what you do is you, you actually look at the, the complete distribution or you want to sample from the output distribution of a, of a quantum computer. And that's kind of important because if you would only look at uh, a single output, so for example, do a binary measurement to, to, to kind of uh, solve maybe a decision problem, uh, then, then it would be much more difficult to, to find these gaps. So, so we need to, to look at uh, the sampling problem where you look at the whole distribution of the output. Um, um, <clears throat> so as, as kind of the Google experiment shows, we, we can, uh, these devices or these kind of problems can be solved with, with so-called NISC devices, which is, means noisy uh, intermediate scale quantum devices. Um, and they tolerate uh, some, at least some constructions tolerate some noise. Usually, they only tolerate noise of, of a very specific structure and uh, under additional and need additional assumptions. But at least there, there are some arguments that, that these uh, gaps are, are also um, prevail when we, when we allow some noise. Okay, so, this, and th so the other approach is, is kind of what, what I'm going to talk about in the second part of the talk. Um, and that one um, circumvents the, the, the problem of, of this uh, complexity theory limits um, in, in a sense uh, because we are here only looking at uh, shallow circuits. And it turns out for, for shallow circuits, so that, that's like very uh, complexity classes that contain um, only problems that can be solved in, in constant depth, so in a, with a constant depth uh, circuit. And it turns out that in that uh, regime, we can show separations um, um, between quantum and classical. So in particular, for example, this, this is the class of, of uh, constant fanning, uh, constant depth uh, circuits, and then that would be the quantum analog, and we can show that these are, are different. And that's in fact done by in this uh, work by uh, my co-authors. Um, in this case, we're looking at the relational problem. So, so again, we're looking at all the inputs and outputs, and they need to satisfy certain relations um, um, for us to, to decide that, that the, uh, the problem is solved. Um, and uh, we can make some statements about uh, noise tolerance in this case. However, um, there, the kind of the noise thresholds that we would need to really implement this are, are far from, from uh, what is currently available. So there, it seems like this, this approach will not uh, immediately lead to, to um, quantum computational supremacy experiments. OK, so, so now just quickly, um, uh, I want to, to talk about the, the Google experiment, um, because it, it kind of, um, it seems to really tick all the the boxes. Um, so they're looking at, at this problem, uh, which is essentially they're, they're looking at random circuits. I mean, the random circuits have certain structure, but but it's uh, random circuits they look at. And for those, uh, one can show that uh, sampling from their output is is a difficult problem under some very mild assumptions. Uh, uh, essentially, that the that the so-called polynomial hierarchy doesn't collapse, 
you don't need to know what that means, but it's something that most um, um, complexity theorists think will, will not happen um, or should not happen. Um, so they have this kind of uh, class of problems that they're trying to solve. Um, they do have a, a, a quantum device. I mean, that's maybe the most important part that solves uh, an instance of a size uh, that seems to be very difficult to simulate with a classical uh, computer. So this, this assertion has a little bit been challenged by, by uh, IBM, um, who are obviously their competitors in this. Um, but I would still give it a check mark here because they haven't actually shown any uh, simulator. They just said uh, maybe there could be one. So maybe that at some point they will try to, to really simulate this and, and then um, have to reconsider. Um, but for now, that, that seems to be fine. Um, and the, the, other, the only part where one could maybe be a little bit critical is this robustness of the gap in the, in the presence of noise. Um, um, so here, uh, they show that their problem is, is somehow um, still difficult to, to simulate, but only for, for a very particular um, form of the noise, which doesn't seem to be, um, which they justify, but, it, but it's still very restrictive. Um, so we don't actually have a good uh, theory of what, of what happens with, with noise um, uh, for their problem. Um, and it's also not so clear how the, the, how the, the problem would scale with the, with the noise, so whether uh, they can just add some qubits um, at the same level of noise, um, whether they could still uh, then do an, an, an experiment like they did. It's a little bit unclear, but, but I'm sure in the, in the next couple of months or years uh, we'll, we'll be able to remove the, the last doubts about this. And, uh, and really be in a position where we have a good claim that quantum computers can now do things that, that classical computers cannot. OK, so, so the second part um, is about some uh, joint work with Sergey Bravi, David Gosset, and Robert Koenig, um, where we, we show um, a quantum advantage uh, for, for shallow circuits and show that this, this advantage is, is um, um, even uh, holds up when we are under noise. And uh, the, the kind of um, approach we're taking, um, I think, is interesting for, um, for many, or should be interesting for, to, to many of you, because it's, it uses ideas from very different areas of, uh, of quantum information. So we, we use ideas that are um, from uh, non-local games, we use ideas from quantum communication and, and also from, uh, from algorithms. Um, so I, I will hopefully be able to, to, to uh, show you a little bit of the, of the proof and uh, help you understand a little bit of the proof. So what is the result? So the result is essentially that there exists um, uh, a class of um, uh, relation problems um, in such a way that uh, these problems can be solved by a quantum computer, in fact, a very simple quantum circuit. Well, it depends on what you, what you think is simple, but, but this is relatively simple. So it, it, has, uh, it only has nearest neighbor or, or essentially, well, over two um, distance two uh, gates. And it, it does a little bit of Hadamars, and, and all of these are also Clifford gates. So, so it's relatively simple gates. Um, and, um, and the claim is that the output of, of this kind of circuit um, cannot be uh, simulated by a classical, uh, a classical circuit that has less than a logarithmic depth. So it shows a separation between constant depth and uh, quantum devices and uh, of less than logarithmic um, classical devices. Right. Um, and yes, yeah, so, so classical device cannot win it with more than 90% probability or constant depth classical devices. Um, OK, so um, this is, um, yeah, so, so this result itself um, is an improvement on, on the original 
um, proposal in that it, it goes from, um, from instead of a 2D setup of, of in interactions where you have nearest neighbors on, on two dimensions, it goes to, to one dimension. Uh, and that makes it a little bit simpler. And uh, when you do the noise, when we factor in noise resistance, um, um, this will be important. OK, so, so what is the, the challenge here? So, so the challenge is somehow to find a problem uh, that strikes a balance between being um, hard for classical computers and easy for, for quantum computers. Right? Um, and the inspiration we take is, is uh, we start with, with the fact that if we have locality constraints, then there are many instances of where, we, where we see a quantum advantage. Um, and the example that we pick, or the, the, the kind of starting place for us, is this Magic Squares game that hopefully many of you know. Uh, but for those who don't, um, it's, it's kind of a, a, a challenge between two players, Alice and Bob. Um, so they're both asked to fill in um, either the columns or the rows of, of, a, um, of a matrix uh, with minus 1 and plus 1 so that the rows, uh, the columns should multiply to minus 1 and the rows to, to plus 1. So they're asked to fill out one, one of the three rows. Um, um, or Alice is asked to fill a, a, one of the columns, and Bob is asked to fill, uh, fill out one of the rows. And the, the second condition is that at one point, these, the, the row and the column will overlap, and at that point, um, they have to give out the same result. So this is a problem that um, without communication between Alice and Bob, even though they might agree on an arbitrary strategy beforehand. Um, once they get their input, they are not allowed to communicate anymore. And uh, it turns out that this is uh, classically impossible to solve with, with probability one. So the best thing they can do is kind of come up with a, with a joint strategy where they uh, uh, already decide what, what they will fill in. But since we cannot fill out this kind of uh, magic square here with uh, consistently satisfying all these conditions, um, there will be at least one point where they, their answer will, will not uh, agree, or they won't satisfy the, the, um, the constraints on the, the rows or columns. Um, so this is an example of a problem that, that cannot be solved uh, classically with probability 1. But it turns out that um, that for quantum uh, players, um, there is a solution um, uh, for this where, where, where they can win with probability 1. So this is an example of, of a, of a non-local game. Um, um, so here I'm just trying to formalize it a little bit more. <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, where the inputs are now given by um, uh, number 1, 2, 3, so indicating which row or column. Um, the outputs are these minus 1 and 1s, uh, three, 3 of them. And then we have the winning condition. So that's just repeating uh, what I had informally on the, on the last slide. Um, and then we have a, a quantum strategy that, that can win this with certainty. Um, this quantum strategy uh, uh, essentially does um, means that they will do these, these measurements. So these three um, um, poly measurements, they, they commute. Um, so you can do them at the, at the same time, and this gives you then the, the three values, um, and same for uh, uh, same for columns and rows. And, it, and these measurements are done on on both sides of of um, so both for Alice and Bob, on on uh, two entangled states, maximum entangled states they share. So th since these are uh, uh, let's say they, these are um, uh, singlet states, then if they do the same measurement on both sides, they will get the same outcome. Uh, sorry, they will get opposite outcomes. <coughs> sorry. Um, but obviously they can correct for that and, and always output the same thing. And the cardinality constraints are, are satisfied because you can see that by just multiplying um, these three matrices. So this is strategy for, for actually winning this game. Um, and um, now we kind of want to 
move this from the setting of, of non-local games to, um, to a circuit. So the, the immediate thing we can do is, is just um, well write this whole thing down as a circuit. So the first part here would only uh, create the maximum entangled states, the two we need. And the second part essentially just rotates it, rotates us in the, in the right basis um, to do the measurements I just uh, described. So it's not so important what, what exactly these unitaries are, but they, they depend on the, on the inputs uh, that they both get. And in the end, we just do a measurement always in the same basis, in the, in the computational basis. Um, and in this kind of uh, circuit setting, it was uh, kind of useful to remove the, the third output. Uh, as I said, these three measurements commute, so, so we can compute the, the third bit from the other two, essentially just um, making sure that the, the parity constraints are, are satisfied. Okay, so we, we can kind of play this, this game in a circuit. But obviously that's too easy. I mean, th this can easily be, this behavior between input and output can easily be um, simulated by a classical computer because they can just, uh, there are no communication constraints in here anymore, right? Um, so we need to, to do a little bit more than that. Um, and the idea is that it's as follows. So when we scale up this, uh, this problem, um, and we have now many inputs, and let's say um, alpha and beta are given at, at certain locations, then um, if our circuits, as in, in our case, are restricted by, by a constant fan in, there's kind of a light cone of, of how far the information about the input can go um, inside, inside the circuit. And uh, if we have logarithmic depth, then, then these light cones will overlap. Uh, but in, the, in constant depth, uh, they, they won't. Um, so if you just um, kind of had uh, this, this constraint on classical circuits that they cannot talk to, to bits that are, uh, or to, that they cannot have wires that go from one place to another, um, then, then that would be sufficient. But obviously, uh, for our classical circuits, we, we can't really um, assume such a thing. So. Uh, it could be that this, this circuit is wired in such a way that, that uh, this input beta immediately goes over to, to alpha and, and they can still solve this problem easily. So um, to, to overcome this, what we need to do is, is to choose these inputs randomly. So choose the locations randomly. Um, if we choose the locations randomly, then still for, for kind of with the same argument, we can show that uh, with high probability, the light cones of the two inputs will not overlap, just because they are so small compared to um, um, the number of number of inputs. Okay, so because it's it's only a constant um, depth here, the the um, and the number of of inputs and outputs scales with with n. Okay, so, so if these don't overlap, then kind of we, we have introduced in some way a, a, a communication constraint on the problem. And uh, it's now hard to, for a classical computer to, to deal with this. Now, um, it might also be too hard for, for, a, um, for a quantum device now, because uh, now we have the situation where we have these inputs at, at random locations of the circuit and how do we make sure that these random locations are then entangled <coughs> so that, that we can actually play the game? Um, and so for this, we, we need a second ingredient, and that, that ingredient is kind of from, from uh, quantum communication, uh, which is the entanglement swap. So an entanglement swap, um, we can kind of uh, also look at it as a circuit. So in the first part, we just create some, some bell states, two bell states. And then the entanglement swap is a measurement on, on two, on, on one qubit of each uh, of these states um, in, in the Bell basis, and then a controlled uh, Pauli operation applied to the, to the remaining two, uh, two qubits. And the effect of this is essentially that at, at the end, we do have, again, a, a maximally entangled state, but now between uh, the, the first and the fourth uh, uh, qubit here. So it's a way of essentially, if you have two parties, 
um, uh, three parties um, or two parties connected to an intermediary um, using entanglement, then, then there is some measurement the intermediary can do and some local corrections the two parties have to do so that in the end they have uh, they share the entanglement directly. And this is kind of a, a basic <coughs> ingredient in, in all kind of uh, quantum networking situations. So this is what we want to use um, to, to distribute our entanglement. Um, and that kind of brings now brings us now to the final formulation of the problem. So the way this is done now is, is um, we have this, this kind of type of input where J and K are two locations. Alpha and beta are the inputs for the magic squares game. Um, and we just simply um, um, set these inputs here to, to alpha when, when we are at the location where we are going to play the game. And otherwise, it's, it's set to 0, 0. And the circuit now does either, um, so if, uh, if alpha is not 0, 0, then it will rotate into the right basis to do the, the magic square uh, measurement. And if it's uh, 0, 0, then it will rotate into the right basis to do the entanglement swap measurement. And in the end, we just do, do all of these measurements. So this is essentially um, encoding this entanglement swap protocol um, apart from the last step, uh, because we would have needed to, um, depending on what we measure here during this entanglement swap, we would have needed to make a poly correction um, on the other qubits. But we are not doing this. So this is going to be, uh, this is the only difference from, from what I've shown uh, before. Um, and the effect of this, uh, of not doing this correction, is that, that we are now um, um, playing this poly, uh, sorry, playing this magic squares game, but, but with the wrong bell state, um, right? So, so when we do the, the entanglement swap measurement, we get one of four bell states, uh, but which one depends on, on, on our measurement outcomes, and we will need to do a rotation to, to always move it to the same one. So now we are essentially playing magic squares with the, with the wrong bell state. Um, and the question is now whether this is still difficult uh, to simulate. And for that, um, yeah, we just need um, some last ingredient. And that is just a, a property of the, the Clifford group. So the nice thing about this magic squares game is that all the measurements, all the rotations we had to do um, were Clifford gates. And the Clifford gates have this property that you can commute uh, poly gates through them. Um, so you, you, if you have some uh, poly operations applied before uh, a Clifford circuit, you can compute the um, a set of poly gates to be applied after the Clifford circuit such that these two things are the same. Um, so this is a very useful property. And in this particular case, it tells us that uh, we don't really need to do this uh, these poly um, rotations on the state. We instead can just um, uh, compute what their effect um, would be on, on, our, um, on our output. <coughs> so the idea, yeah, since, since everything is, is, um, is uh, Clifford, we can commute it through. And then once we do the measurement, we just need to check whether uh, we did um, a, a, um, a bit flip before we did the measurement or not. And, and if we did a bit flip before, then we just have to invert our, our uh, measurement output. And this, the C um, rotation wouldn't matter, for example. So what this means is we can, we can come up with a, a, an analog game where instead of requiring uh, this condition that the two, two outputs are the same, uh, we instead uh, have some more complicated winning condition that depends now on on exactly what uh, bell state we are playing with. Um, <clears throat> okay, so that that kind of brings it then to the final. Um, uh, the final description of the of the game. 
Uh, these are the inputs, as, as mentioned before, and then the outputs satisfy this, this relation where, where all of these, um, <coughs> these parameters here are essentially computed from all the measurements between Alice and Bob, right? So the locations are at random locations. We do entanglement swaps everywhere in between. And from that, we can compute these uh, four parameters that tell us uh, what, what are the two bell states for which we are in the end going to play uh, magic squares. And then we require that this, this condition is satisfied. And obviously, the quantum device will, will uh, do this perfectly, because that's the way we, we constructed it. Um, so it will always win. Um, <clears throat> the question is, what or is this now still uh, difficult for a classical device? And that's actually not too, too difficult to see. Uh, essentially, because the, the, the light cones uh, for these two inputs don't intersect, we can, we can see that these parameters here, they're a function of, of uh, um, they're a product of, 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 of kind of measurement results that can only depend on one of the inputs and, and part of the, the other. So they have this, this kind of product form, which means that, that Alice and Bob cannot uh, easily, uh, well, we can then map this to, to a game where we give uh, Alice and Bob more, more power uh, to win the um, uh, magic squares. And, and essentially, we allow them to, to choose um, their own winning condition. But they're only able to choose the winning condition in a way uh, such that the winning condition is, in fact, the product of their, of their two choices. So if we kind of uh, give them this additional power, it turns out that the, the problem is still um, difficult. So there's still no classical way to win these magic squares with probability more than 8 over 9. Um, and one can see this by, by essentially reducing every such strategy to, to a strategy of, of the, the original game. So um, that kind of um, uh, brings us to the, um, the conclusion that, that this, this problem is, is one that, that can be solved by constant depth quantum device, but cannot be solved by constant depth um, classical device. So in, in complexity theoretic language, this problem shows that, that these two classes are not the same. Um, but it's actually that our motivation here is not so much complexity theoretic, but we really tried actually to come up with a, a simple problem that is not only uh, constant depth, but is actually simple to implement. So <clears throat> as you've seen, this, this kind of circuit, it's, it's depth five, so it's, it's very shallow. Um, and all the gates are, are on a line. So, so you only need to have qubits on a line with nearest neighbor interactions. In fact, you need to, to hop over one uh, neighbor. So, but it's still um, local in, in one dimension. And the, the worst thing you need to do is, is a classically controlled um, two qubit gates. Uh, they're controlled by the, the input. Well, essentially, one can, it's not really necessary to think about this control very much because it's determined by the input. So just when you get the input of the, the instance, um, and then, then you decide what, what the, the circuit is that you're going to run. Um, it's not, uh, not interactive. Um, so that makes it um, uh, quite simple. Um, and uh, uh, we, we have this separation. <laughs> so now um, this is kind of nice, but it, it, it only satisfies the, the first uh, item on the list of, of kind of uh, I had there for, for supremacy. So it's, it's kind of a, a, a class of problems where we have an asymptotic gap. Um, one problem here is that we, we had to go into such small uh, um, classes that the gap is, um, is not really, doesn't seem to be really strong enough. I mean, it's between constant and logarithmic uh, depth, but for, it, for logarithmic depth to really be, become a problem uh, for a classical computer, we would need to choose um, the n really, really large. And, uh, and that doesn't seem to be a, a, a um, kind of a, a setting where, where we would want to be. Um, 
So it's, it's much better to have a separation between polynomial and exponential time, for example, as, is, as they have for the um, Google experiment. Okay, so that's one issue. The other issue is that um, this was only the noiseless case. So we assumed that, that uh, the quantum computer does not have any noise. So the, the main contribution uh, of our work, which I'm, I'm just going to um, skim through. How much time do I have? OK. Yeah, so I'm just going to uh, tell you the result. We can show that this, this construction is actually robust to noise and, and to a very uh, general class of noise, where we essentially assume, so it's called the stochastic, local stochastic noise. The assumption there is only that um, errors, so you can have arbitrary errors that can, they can be correlated between different qubits. The only assumption is that if, if the, um, they're correlated between qubits, it kind of it's suppressed exponentially in the number of, of uh, qubits that are affected by, by an error. Um, so this is quite a general um, noise model. And in this noise model, we can show that uh, there exists an, another uh, class of problems that can be solved with a quantum computer with um, <coughs> probability arbitrarily close to one. Um, and um, again, in constant depth. Um, and here, they have to be geometrically local in, in 3D, which is a bit of a problem. Um, um, if the, the noise is below a, a, a certain threshold, but that threshold is independent of n. Okay, so the noise, meaning the noise uh, per, per qubit. Um, <clears throat> and again, we have this gap, so, so it's a little bit weaker, but, but it's still essentially a, a classical computer that wants to solve this with high probability needs to have at least logarithmic depth. So we have a separation between noisy um, constant depth quantum devices and logarithmic depth um, classical devices. Um, yeah, so one issue here, obviously, is that it's in 3D, um, um, meaning that we would need to, to have a three-dimensional array of, of qubits that, that can interact with their nearest neighbors or have a setup where, where um, we have more than nearest neighbor interactions. Um, OK. Um, yeah, so I'm going to skip uh, the, the proof of this um, and come directly to the conclusions. Um, yeah, so I showed the separation uh, for the noises case. Um, for the noisy case, we would ideally like to, to it to be in, in uh, geometrically two-dimensional because that would make it more realistic uh, for implementations. Um, the, the Google device, for example, was uh, qubits arranged on a, on a square lattice, so that's a 2D local uh, system. Um, then we can look at, OK, how does this now match up with the, the conditions we would need to, to show uh, quantum computational supremacy? Well, we kind of have a, a, an asymptotic gap, but, but it, it might be too small. Um, but mostly the issue is that um, because this gap is too small, then, then we cannot really satisfy the third point. Um, um, so we would need to have a really huge uh, quantum device so that somehow log n uh, becomes problematic to, as a runtime for a, for a classical device, which um, yeah, seems, seems very unrealistic. Um, but in a way, the, the gap is between constant and, and logarithmic. So um, you can take n to be arbitrary large and, the, and amplify the gap arbitrary much. Um, it's just the, the problem that, that the numbers are uh, uh, too large. And the other issue is that the threshold, the noise threshold for which we can show that it's, uh, the separation is robust is very low. Uh, I mean, we also didn't optimize it, but that, that's not realistic either in, with uh, current devices. Um, yes, that brings me to the, the end of my talk. And thanks a lot for your attention.